Now, since this is a mecha gaming channel, you might have asked, well, Dion, where's all the mech games? Shut up. Here it is. Gun Griffin Blaze, the perfect mech game for beginners to both mecha or gaming. Game Arts makes a whole bunch of varied stuff, including the Grandia series. Even though they're ancient and their website looks like this, they have 27 employees and worked on Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and they keep hopping consoles. As how I even got into the mech genre in the first place was the original Gun Griffin on the Sega Saturn when I was like six years old. This game case oozes with the same exact sense of style and way too much that you were probably familiar with in the era. Look at this holographic printing. While we're talking about the era, let's take a trip down memory lane first. The PS2 I dug out of storage to play this is about to be very confused. You might have noticed the screen is green, so we'll just fix that. One of the things to note is that I'm playing this on a modern TV via an HDMI adapter in 16x9, and there's quite a bit of delay from console to TV with a modern setup. This wasn't true with older CRTs for a number of reasons, but it shouldn't be so drastic that I can't play an old era shooter on it. Also, the PS2 memory card is so small. Nowadays, you can get a much larger one for very cheap. 8 megabytes, which is the size limit on a YouTube thumbnail, somehow stores a bunch of games data. The intro cutscene for Gun Griffin Blaze gets you immediately pumped for what would have been heavily touted as purely an action game. First person shooter? Mecha? Those kind of terms don't appeal to a mainstream audience. We need explosions. Action rock music. The press start screen holds a somber tone, as you see the remnants of the battle that just took place in the intro. It's a mood that you won't really see again, but will kind of stick with you. Certain events in the story, which only shows up in a written format hidden in some menus, such as Russia's attack on Ukraine or China's seizing of Tibet, were slated to have happened after World War III in like 2015. As we can see, real life is quite predictable from like 20 years ago. This game has some very clear arcade influences keeping up with that action pacing from the press start screen that almost looks like an insert coin prompt to the level variety and pickups there's even a high score counter and a timer to keep you reined in this isn't to say it's limited by these conventions but leans into them for an adequate game feel that retains the pace that the soundtrack gets across the soundtrack speaking of puts you in the moment each and every mission has its own short theme that's a couple of minutes long. It constantly loops, but this is fine because not only are these good songs, there's a pretty short mission length with none of them exceeding like 12 minutes. While the game is a little confusing at first because it has no training wheels, no tutorials, unless you read this glorious novella of a manual. You do just sort of have to figure it out, which is fine as the game is very short, only like five or six levels. And while it does have four difficulties to select from, once you know the basics, the game isn't that complicated. Level zero is destroy all targets. That's your training mission. Level one is destroy specific targets. Level two is destroy specific targets, but they have a terrain advantage. Level three is protect your allies. Level four is protect specific allies and your enemy has a terrain advantage. And level five is destroy more targets than can reasonably be expected from the player. Every level gets harder than the last very quickly. Like seriously, Egypt is decently challenging even on the easiest difficulty. It takes either major trial and error or a very specific loadout to do. So if you like bashing your head against the wall, trying new things, and are satisfied when the game gives you this little complete in the color of the highest difficulty you've done a mission on, then this game's going to be satisfying enough. This game has what I would consider monster polish for the time, with small things like constant radio chatter, cameras glitching out when you're heavily damaged, blur on the zoom effects, your gun moving with the momentum of your mech, your view jerking on large hits. This is also one of the first games I know of where every single bullet is a projectile and has its own velocity and hitbox. This game knows what it is. This is exactly the same kind of effort you'd see from several mech games later on. You guys remember Hawken? Because almost everything about that game's polish was directly ripped from Gun Griffin Blaze for better or worse. I do have to talk about the game's like one major drawback. The high score mechanic is only programmed to trigger once per mission clear, meaning earning medals is a lot more of a replay grind if you're already good at it, or just absolutely trash the ceiling in one 
one run. The rewards after missions are broken up into medals you get by clearing those high score goals and a few selectable power-ups or weapons you can have at the start of a mission in the hangar screen. Instead of just giving you everything you pick up, you have to choose carefully and balance upgrades, weapons, or these neat little doable bottle kits? You might not even be interested in that. Mech unlocks are also tied to medals, and because of the tiered high score goals, this can take an absurdly long time. Thankfully, I've already had a save file sitting around with a good amount of progress on it, even though it's only three hours, and I already beat all the missions. While there are only four mech unlocks, they have good variety. The HiMax 3 is your starting mech. With its speed and decent starting rifle, it's good at all ranges and in all scenarios. The Type 9, with its extremely powerful sniper weapon and the ability to just spam grenades. The Type 14, with its absolutely bonkers missile array. And the, excuse me for my pronunciation, Jagged Panther. With its dual chain guns and absurdly good rocket pods, this is the Apex Predator. I will mention that it's kind of disappointing that you can't just play anything from a tank to these running walkers to a spider walker or maybe even a helicopter given that flight mechanics are already built in but it is what it is. A perfect sequel to this game would have more levels and more playable mechs but sadly I don't think we'll ever get one. The mech designs and story are somewhat grounded in reality, surprisingly enough. There's even a model viewer that shares some of the history of these machines. Whoever worked on this game was not just a fan of mecha, but a fan of military vehicles, likely from their background in model kits, I'm guessing. Even for very simple mech designs, they are filled with detail, from folding wings, hydraulic ankles, wheel systems, jet propulsion systems, sensor arrays, even traffic taillight indicators. Someone really put some thought into these aside from just making anime style cool robots. I also like how technical all the descriptions of mechs and weapons are, even though you can tell they're a little loosely translated. I feel like a modern game with more clear descriptions would really benefit the style. There are some definite misses like one additional weapon in a game just being named gun. The UI is rather unobtrusive but includes a jump charge meter, your health bar, all your arcade stats like your timer, enemies that are the goal or alive, allies that are the goal or alive, an altimeter, a compass, a rangefinder, whether your auto walk function is on, your total ammo count. Honestly, it's quite impressive how they got all this info to be available without obstructing the game screen. I mentioned an automatic walk function. This is tied to a separate control scheme that if you have an emulator and a flight stick would absolutely be massive fun to play with as it allows for some advanced maneuvers over the typical run and gun first person shooter control scheme. I was only able to use it in combat a few times and there is this weird drive-by like thing you can do if you angle yourself just right but it isn't immensely preferable or anything unless you're going for less of a shooter feel and more of a mech piloting feel which is really up to you. I also have to mention that playing this on the PS2 the unchangeable Southpaw setting is pretty bad. There's no excuse for this. You aim with the left stick and move with the right, which is backwards from just about every single shooter standard that exists in history after this game came out. All in all though, that's what's cool about Gun Griffin Blaze. It's just, it's a neat little game that I feel so many people overlook because of the somewhat awkward control scheme, or maybe it's too short or too niche to be on most people's hidden gem lists, but I still love it. The style and polish always stuck with me, especially for how small the team working on it was. Reading the credits, you see names repeat over and over and over again. And that wasn't too uncommon back in the day. I just, I have to give major props to the people who made this impressive title. Now, uh, this isn't part of the review and I'm recording this a little bit later, but I think this is a small, cool piece of, uh, video game history in writing and i'm not gonna make a separate video for this because why would i so allow me to read the translator's notes from the back of the manual 
Uh, I guess I'll just put a mission of the game on screen. A number of the media commented that Gun Griffin Blaze was a weird title for working designs to release, considering what we've done in the past. While it isn't necessarily a clear choice, this is a game that we've been longing to do ever since the final winter consumer electronics show more than six years ago. It just took until now for everything to line up right so we could be involved. Back when we were still involved in the original Lunar 2, we had a meeting with Game Art staff at the final consumer electronics show. This was the last CES that the console game industry attended in any meaningful way. After that meeting, we went out to dinner with the president and many of his staff. Having been told about their next generation RPG to be developed for the upcoming 32-bit consoles, I asked what he had to show or tell. He whipped out an 8mm video Walkman and showed me test footage of a mech walking around a house in 3D. He said that was some of the test work they were doing for what would become Grandia, but the tests actually took on a life of their own and became the original Gun Griffin. Flash forward about three years, Gun Griffin is almost ready, but the costs are extremely high, and one of the 32-bit platforms is not doing well enough for us to be involved. Seriously bummed, we see the title go to the first party publisher, who promptly misunderstand it and market it so that all of five people get to see it. The weird thing is that we were involved with the title in an accidental way up this point as well, since the publisher wanted to take out the Gun Griffin title and call it Iron Rain. Well, we had the World War II strategy game Iron Storm coming out at almost the same time. Not to mention that the new title sucked really hard. So I called a few friends at their Japanese parent company and convinced them that, even though we weren't doing the title, the name should stay Gun Griffin because it was a much cooler name. And because changing the name to something so close to Iron Storm would really mess with people's heads at retail. Fortunately for the world of gaming, they listened, and the uber cool title Gun Griffin stayed. In the successive years, Gun Griffin 2 was released in Japan. It was an upgrade in almost every way, but the US market for that 32-bit underdog was such that it was impossible for even the hardware manufacturer to do it justice here. So, it was never seen stateside. Now, over six years after, we saw that 8mm video at the Consumer Electronics Show, in the palm of Game Arts President's hand, we finally got to to do the game we really wanted to do in the beginning. But what an upgrade we got. As you know, this PlayStation 2 computer entertainment system version fully realizes the Gun Griffin world imagined so long ago. Smoke trails, realistic fire, fast action, great sound. This version of Gun Griffin is really the greatest yet, and a large leap over the previous two in the series. Aside from translating the text, re-recording some of the radio chatter, and fixing button layouts, we had to do little to make this a game we were proud to bring you. And so, the first truly next generation gun griffin now rests in your hands. Thanks for staying in touch. Come visit us on our message board, which likely doesn't exist anymore. Or drop us snail or email. We appreciate your support, and never forget that you're the ones we need to keep pleasing. We really are nothing without you. Check out our other PlayStation 2 computer entertainment system release, Treasures and Game Mart's awesome Sylphie, and we'll see you soon. Finally, with Lunar 2's Eternal Blue complete. Wild. <laughs>